In this video, we're going to look at um, the distribution of products that could be formed um, by free radical halogenation and some interesting trends that emerge when we look at the various halo um, halogen donors, that is the various X2 agents and the ratio of products that could be formed using different um, alkane starting materials. So let's get our notes in front of us. Um, the first thing I wanna do is actually start you with um, some data. So let's predict the products. For the following, let's say we have this molecule and we add to it F2, fluorine two, okay? And then um, just to make the point that the conditions that we do this reaction under don't influence the outcome of the of uh, the reaction too much. That is, it doesn't affect what I'm trying to tell you about this. Let's take this and use either heat or light and predict the products. Well, if we assess the starting material, just a tad, we could see that we've got an HA in the middle and then actually nine HBs circling around the outside. You could flip the A and the B certainly, whatever is easiest for you. So we could have B, 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 B. Okay. Nine HBs, one HA. And so the two products that we could form would be one where we draw the original molecule and we replace, we replace HA with F. And so we would call that product A. And then another one where we replace one of the HBs. It doesn't matter which one with the fluorine atom. And that would form product B. Now, what is interesting is we can actually make some experimental observations where the ratio of the two products are 14% A to 86% B. Okay, well, it's kind of interesting that they're not formed in an equal ratio. That is um, the ratio of products heavily favors product B so we would say that A is the minor product in this case, and B is the major product. So, okay, that's an interesting number. Is this a number that in a normal semester where you didn't have your notes to use on an exam, um, is this an example where we would ask you to memorize these numbers? No, no, I would never ask you to memorize these numbers. They're, I think they're very interesting numbers, um, but especially when we look at them in the context of some of the other halogens, but the specific numbers, let's not memorize. Um, especially in this case. Now, if we look at the ratio of A to B and we have the various halogens, like let's say we've got F2, Cl2, and Br2. Now I2 is a little bit wonky because the products are unstable. So let's focus on these three instead. When we do the experiment with F2, I said that the ratio was 14 to 86, where B was the dominant product that was formed. Now, it turns out that if you switch the halogen atom to um, Cl2, you get different numbers. You get 36% A and then 64% B. And then lastly, for bromine, the ratio shifts even more towards A, where now we've flipped what we call the selectivity for the product where now product A is the major product and product B is a significant minor product. Now what we wanna do in this lecture is address why. Why do we flip the selectivity? That is why do we flip the, select, the, the ratio of the major and minor? So um, what I'm gonna do, I just wrote, sorry, I'll, what we're going to do is look at the chemi chemical phenomena as to why we flip which one is the major and which one is the minor. And that gets into this arena of chemistry called chemical selectivity or sometimes referred to as chemo selectivity. I'm, I'm just going to stick with chemical selectivity for the sake of making things um, simple. So uh, let's go over here and just define that. So chemical selectivity 
This just describes the preference for forming one isomer over another. Okay, so in this case, it's constitutional isomers. So if we have an X here versus an X here, an HA or an HB substitution, we would just recognize that both of these have the same formula, but um, they, so they're isomers of each other, but they have different connectivity. So these are constitutional isomers. Okay, so why do the product ratios change with different halogen atoms. That is the, when I say product ratios, I'm talking about the selectivity change with different X tubes. Okay, so, um, the reality is, is that the correspond, the, the, the short answer, let me say the short, it's all reality. The short answer is that the radicals of the each halogen atom react differently. So the radicals that I'm referring to are X dot, which could be F dot, Cl dot and Br dot. So each of these radicals just reacts differently and that's why we see the different selectivity. Now, namely, what we could say is that F dot reacts quickly. And by reacts quickly, what I'm saying is this is quick to abstract hydrogen atoms. It's quick to abstract hydrogen atoms. And what this gets at is the first propagation step in the mechanism. So where we've got our X dot already formed and we're going to react that with some carbon atom that has a hydrogen. If you recall, we let the halogen steal the hydrogen to form a carbon radical plus, in this case, HF. This is a very fast reaction. Now there's a general trend that we see in chemistry where in chemistry, faster means less selective. Faster means less selective. And so if we're less selective, we will get a statistical ratio of product. Now think about what that means, a statistical ratio. So if we think back to our molecule that we labeled that has one HA and nine HBs, what is the statistical ratio of products that would be formed if we didn't have any experimental data. I gave you the answer, the ratio is 14 to 86, but statistically speaking, what is the likelihood of forming any of each of the products? So to do that, we just kind of look back and we say for this molecule with HA and HB, I'm just gonna label HB in a different position. There were nine HBs present, nine times HB versus one times HA. This means that we predict the ratio based on statistics alone. Statistics alone suggest that the ratio of product A's to the ratio of product B's should be, sorry, lost my pen there. I lost my pen again. I don't think I'm out of batteries. Oh boy. Okay. So I'm just going to pause this quick. Pause. Okay. And we're back. Sorry about that. And let me 
change my uh, video settings just a second. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I guess that's bound to happen at, at some point. Um, so let's get this back in front of us now. Okay, back, here we are. All right, so the ratio of the HA product substitution to the HB product substitution we would predict to be about um, one to nine based on the ratio of hydrogen atoms. There are nine times as many hydrogen atoms, um, uh, HB hydrogen atoms, than there are HA hydrogen atoms. So we would predict the ratio of products to be um, one to nine. So this is predicted. Now the actual outcome, because um, this is just statistics, it's ignoring some other chemical phenomena that we'll get to in a second. Um, the chemical phenomena that uh, shows, or just the chemical measurement, I should say, shows that the ratio is about 14 to 86. That's pretty good. I mean, statistics is just statistics. It's just counting things and ignoring everything else about the about the molecule other than the identity of the elements. And so we, we do pretty well. Um, and so what we say about fluorine is it's more of a statistical um, reactant in this type of process, where it's going to give a product ratio based on the number of hydrogen atoms that are present. So fluorine reacts to give a statistical ratio of products. Now what this means for us is, um, and this is based on the hydrogen count. Now, what this means for us is that the major product results from the greatest or most likely um, no, most likely kind of implies um, some chemical aspect of this. Oh, results from the, the most abundant hydrogens. Let's just say that. That is to say there were more HBs, so product B was formed. And then conversely, the minor product arises from the smallest number of H atoms. That is to say there were fewest, um, the fewest number of H atoms in our example was, uh, fewest was HA, so product, if product B was formed most, product A was formed least. And we could go through a, a lot of examples of this. We looked at some free radical halogenations last time where I said it was important to recognize when hydrogens were sort of the same as one another or they would give rise to the same products. So as we get better and better at recognizing that, we will also get conversely better and better at recognizing what will be the major and minor products if we have fluorine as our reactant. Now what I wanna do is move on to um, bromine. So bromine now flips the script a little bit. So with Br2, experimentally, recall that we move from, instead of an 86 to 14 ratio of, and let's, let's keep it consistent here, 14 to 86, excuse me. Instead of a 14 to 86 ratio of A to B, we have a 99 to one ratio. Not only have we flipped the major product, but we've done so um, in a big way, right? I mean, we barely see any of A compared to the amount of B that's formed. And so that's a really important concept because what that tells us, excuse me, if BR is big and 
slow. How do we know that? How do I know that Br is big and slow? Well, Br is lower on the periodic table. And so elements that are lower on the periodic table just have more subatomic particles and they get to be bigger elements. Now, what's this idea about slow? I mean, these aren't like, like I don't know, basketballs or some sort of ball, right? I mean, it's not like an exercise ball versus a baseball. That analogy, it might be in terms of size, but that analogy doesn't work on atoms, <laughs> right? Well, sort of. Um, what we notice is that it's slow because it's so highly selective. Fluorine is kind of zipping around, grabbing hydrogen atoms as best it can at random. And so statistics dominate. If we get to more, as we approach randomness, statistics will start to dominate. That is, it's more likely to bump into an HB in this case, or excuse me, uh, yeah, an HB in this case than an HA. And so that'll be the one that's most likely to react. However, bromine slows down and is more selective. Now, why does it pick off um, HA in this case? HA is sort of tucked inside the molecule and there's fewer of them. Why is it saying, what makes bromine smart enough, if, it is, if you call it smart, to sit back and be like, okay, I'm going to ignore all of you except this one unique, I don't know, um, whatever, black, I don't know, I'm not going to get into it. So why does it pick the one unique hydrogen that's tucked inside the molecule? Well, the bromine knows something that the fluorine clearly doesn't. It knows that radicals that are more substituted are more stable. So radicals that are more substituted are also more stable. Well, what does that mean? That means that Br dot has an opportunity, it recognizes that it has an opportunity to form HA versus HB. And it knows that if it reacts by path B, it's going to form a radical at this position. Okay, this is the radical that's an intermediate that inevitably then reacts with Br2 to form the final product, which is product B. I won't go through the whole mechanism, see the last lecture for the mechanism of free radical halogenations. Whereas with A, we're going to form a different carbon-centered radical, one that looks like this, that inevitably, if this was product B, then we're going to form product A right here. Now, what I want to highlight about the lower radical is that it's more substituted. That's a really important concept. It's more substituted. Now, why is it more substituted? It's more substituted because the carbon with the radical has fewer H atoms. Why does that matter? Well, recall that when we replace H atoms with groups, we call those groups substituents. It is as though they've substituted for the hydrogen. Okay, so fewer H atoms means more substituents. Fewer H atoms means more substituents. And more substituents means that we're more substituted. Okay. If you think about it this way, what we have is if we have some thing on a carbon and three hydrogens attached, we call that a methyl thing, okay? So that is the methyl radical. 
Now what I'm going to do is replace the um, one of the hydrogens on this molecule with an R group. Now R is just some variable for a group that's not hydrogen. Maybe I'll highlight that. So this is a non-hydrogen substituent. Now, with um, if we replace another hydrogen atom with an R group, and then replace, draw an example where we replace all of the hydrogens with R groups, what we've done as we kind of proceed through here, and I've got kind of um, less than signs, what we're doing is we are increasing the substitution at the carbon atom. Okay. Where if we break down each of these, we can count the number of substituents they have and suggest how, um, and then actually provide a name for the type of thing that we're looking at. So let's look at an example, or let's look at, let's break this down and then we'll look at examples. If I've got a thing attached to a carbon with three hydrogens, I call that a methyl and then whatever the thing is. So this would be a methyl radical if we were looking at the carbon with the dot attached to it. Now, the methyl radical is the least substituted, and methyl things in general are least substituted. We'll look at all sorts of methyl things. We'll look at um, methyl halides coming up where we have a halogen atom attached. We'll talk about methyl cations, methyl anions, methyl, um, and really it's just one. So the methyl cation, the methyl anion, that sort of thing. Now in every, every case, methyl represents the least substituted form of that thing. So it's least substituted. And in the case of radicals, it's the least stable. Okay. So as soon as we introduce an R group, I know the thing is kind of is kind of awkward, but it works for this early introduction. What we're going to do is we're going to recognize that now we have one substituent. And that is that R group. So we say this is now a one and then we write the degree and then we say it's a one degree thing. Now, we don't say one degree, instead we say a primary thing. Now this is really important to be able to recognize various functional groups and, and label them as primary and then secondary and tertiary, which is coming up in just a second, is a critical skill in organic chemistry. At first it seems like some unusual nomenclature, but it's something that we use throughout all of organic chemistry and it's just something to get used to. So this, if we had, a radical where we had an R group, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen, we would call this carbon a primary radical. Whoops. Um, I'll just write it down here, primary. Radical. So let's keep going. If we add another substituent to this, it then becomes a secondary radical. So, and this is generally true of any carbon with some thing attached to it. We're focusing on the, where the thing is a dot or a radical, but it could be other functional groups. So now we have two R groups. So this is a secondary thing that we write as a two degree. And that two corresponds to two substituents. And again, this is a secondary 
and then the thing is how you would pronounce that. The symbol is T with a degree, the pronunciation is secondary. And so we could continue our discussion of radicals and say that this is a secondary radical. And then a thing with three R groups or three substituents and zero hydrogens. I don't like to focus on the hydrogens. I like to focus on the number of substituents. We would write a three degree, in this case, a thing. And that would be a tertiary thing. Now, the thing about tertiary is we've, we've kind of built up the substitution as we've added more substituents. So this tertiary thing is the most substituted. And when we're talking about a tertiary radical between a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary radical, this tertiary radical is most stable because it's most substituted. There are cases where we have functional groups that are more stable when they're less substituted, but it turns out for the most part, more substitution equals an increase in stability. And so when we look at the two radicals that could result from X2, we have a primary radical and a tertiary radical. And the tertiary radical is more stable. And what that means is that if we're reacting these radicals, if we're forming these radicals with X2 equals BR2, this will be, um, the primary radical will be less stable and less likely to form. That's significant. It's significant that the primary radical, which has more hydrogens available to it, is not going to be formed as often as the tertiary radical because the tertiary radical is more stable. So the bromine, being slow as slow as it is, is only going to pick on the hydrogen that forms the most stable free radical intermediate. Another way to look at it is the hydrogen that gives rise to the tertiary radical is the weakest hydrogen. And because the bromine atom is moving slow and sluggishly, it can only pull off the weakest of the hydrogens, which in this case gives the most stable free radicals. More on that in just a second. So what that means is that amongst the products, we're going to form the um, less stable product less often. And so that's going to be the minor product. And then this, um, the bromine is going to be the major product. Now, what I want us to do is to move on to an example of this and using each of the halogen atoms, let's try to predict which is going to be the major and the minor product. And so um, what we could do is, uh, let's go ahead and turn the page and let's look at that example. So this is a nice example because if we react this with X2, we could form, and this is an example we did last time, we could form a product with X here and we labeled that A, and then we could form a product with X here and we labeled that B. We labeled this product C and then all the way out here, sorry, X here, that's D. I had to rotate a bond. I did not space this out well. Maybe I should just really quick. Oh, come on. There we go. Just making D look pretty. Okay, now with BR2, what we have to recognize is that A and B, uh, D result from primary radicals. And so they will be the minor products. Whereas if you look, C results from a tertiary radical.
And so this product will be major. Okay. With F2, we get sort of the opposite. We would say that A, not A, uh, D, between all of them, product D is the major product because it because there are six HDs. Whereas product C is minor because there are, there is only one HB excuse me, C. So this takes advantage of, um, which product C and D. So this takes advantage of uh, the analysis that we did last time where we looked at all possible products with this particular um, isomer. So what I want to do now is move on to chlorine. So with Cl2, what we say is we can't predict major and minor. So it's just a little too unpredictable. Chlorine is in between fluorine and bromine. It's not as big and slow as bromine. So it's happy to pull off some of the stronger hydrogens that happen to be more abundant. So it's a little bit more controlled by statistics than bromine, but it's a little bit slower than fluorine. So it's also going to be influenced by the stability of the resulting radical that would be formed during the mechanism. So it kind of um, does both things. And for each individual molecule, you could measure the product distribution and you can make some inferences from that maybe about certain product classes, but you can't broadly kind of predict like we can with fluorine and bromine. So we'll just stick to predicting major and minor product ratios for fluorine and bromine reactions. So um, this is a really interesting and, and first look at selectivity in chemical reactions. And we'll see a lot more opportunities to, to look at this, but this is really important. If you're trying to design, um, if you're trying to conduct an experiment, it would be really nice to know what you think the outcome will be. And if there are multiple outcomes, what the ratio of the various products will be. Like if you want to form one particular product that has any of the halogen atoms, you should be careful as to which of the halogen atoms that you pick. So anyway, uh, next time we'll look at this. In We'll look at a few nuances to this, maybe.